folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the second of today's double bill. If you didn't catch the earlier show about the British Army's anti-locust campaign, and yes, you heard that right, locust, uh, that was worth watching because it was something I knew nothing about prior to having Dr. Yates on. But today we are, or well, this evening, I should say, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, we are continuing our Germans at War week with a look at the Luftwaffe field divisions, which was a particular branch of the military that we'll find out about today. Um, if you are new to the channel, please don't forget to consider becoming a patron and a member because I want to keep on doing this indefinitely. And I'm, this year, I'm still torn with having to go and do my day job guiding and doing this. It'd be nice to kind of move forward and kind of just do this and 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 it be my primary um, my primary job. So if you can think about becoming a subscriber uh, and, a, and a channel member or a patron, it would help me enormously. We've got some good people in the view audience today. Niels Henkemans is watching, so he can jump in on some stuff. He, there's no one who knows the Germans in Normandy is better than Niels. Other people watching it today, so that's really good. But I'm going to bring in my guest. So Michael Stout is a, uh, a teacher of history, professor of history in various places in, in Texas. And he's going to be presenting today about the, the field divisions in the Luftwaffe. So I'll bring him in now. So good afternoon, Michael. How are you today? Doing pretty well. Thank you. So um, as I said there, um, uh, this is a kind of a niche subject, the field divisions. We were just talking before going li live. It's not something that's been written about in huge, huge amounts compared to, for example, the SS divisions or Fallschirmjäger. So how did you get interested in this aspect yourself? Uh, well, I just completed my, dis my dissertation and my PhD uh, quite literally last semester. So my doctor now graduated and all that jazz. But uh, Getting a dissertation topic in graduate school, uh, I was studying with Rob Satino at University of North Texas, and uh, he clued me into an article written by Gerhard Weinberg around the late 90s sometime that was essentially in entitled uh, Unexplored Questions About the German Army in World War II. And the Luftwaffe Field Divisions were one of the questions that Weinberg posed, so I figured that looked interesting, so I started poking around and made a dissertation out of it. And that's what you're basically going to be showing uh, with us the results of that today. And you know, one of the themes that will definitely come up is we were just talking about it before going live, folks, is that the German the, the German military, when things start going wrong, seems to overly complicate its solutions to things rather than finding streamlined, efficient ways of moving forward. It kind of creates new branches and new head administration headaches. And if Philip Blood was watching, he would talk about the the, the overly complicated hierarchies of all these organizations from the SS down to the Waffen SS and everything else. And, and you know, we'll, we'll find out about quite why they're, they're making their, they're trying to find solutions to things, but they're actually making a more complicated solution that probably is actually bringing about more problems than they are, that they are, they're sort of sorting out. But anyway, you've come up uh, armed with your PowerPoint presentation. All you've got to do is tell me when to move on to the next slide. And we're going to talk about Goring's Boys in Blue. So over to you, Michael. And folks, if you have questions, we'll kind of do them as we go along today. Um, so if there's a, because you know, we're going to be covering various the Eastern Front, Western Front, various units. So if you've got a question about a particular unit or one of the campaigns or battles we talk about, we'll kind of do it as we go along. Anything kind of broader theme, we can do that then. But I'm going to hand over to Michael and uh, I will jump in with my occasional comments and um, questions. So over to you. All right. Well, uh, to set our stage here, uh, I, uh, one of the, uh, probably the best place to actually start is actually with a recurring subject that I've seen on this channel before, uh, the myth of German military excellence in World War II. It's only been very recently that historians have started taking that thing apart. Uh, just actually a month ago, you had a show with uh, Rick Herrera and Phil Blood talking about yeah. uh, Alfred's tactique. Uh, I'd highly recommend that one, by the way. Uh, the latter part of that conversation was essentially uh, discussing this entire subject. Uh, the German army's role in the Holocaust was just made uh, clear within the last 30 years. Uh, their flaws within the high command structure and the officer corps, uh, the fact that the German economy was never going to be able to support the German war effort for World War II, uh, and even the most notable uh, parts of the, of the German army, the Panzers and the Luftwaffe, while they were excellent in 39 to 40, uh, faltered very quickly afterward and never really recovered. So, and I'm already seeing comments about the Wehr Wehrmacht fo folks. And uh, yeah. just to share a quote, to share a really probably bad joke from one of my students last semester, the Wehrmachtaholics never like it when you pull their panzers down. I will be doing that today. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I make it a mental note. I will use that one myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the most persistent element of the German military. Uh, excellence myth is that their soldiers were so individually 
uh, skilled. And the, the, the myth of German uh, individual soldier excellence is the one that really hasn't uh, been dealt with as much as the rest of it has. Uh, but in reality, German manpower issues started as far back as 1941 and really even before that. So let's have the first slide and I'll get ourselves clued into what we're talking about here. Uh, the Wehrmacht of 1942 to 43 was far different from the early war. Uh, the short version is that the invasion of the Soviet Union bogged down and with the Red Army counteroffensive in December of 41, uh, the Germans, by March of 1942, have suffered a million casualties at least, which essentially wiped out all of the reserves they had going into the going into World War II itself. And it, even considering the fact that they were pretty much out of reserves at these at the end of the uh, winter crisis of 41-42, uh, you can honestly already say that the Germans have been tapping into their poor quality manpower since the very start of the war. When the German army mobilized in 1939, they were divided into waves. Your first waves were your highest quality troops, second wave, third wave, etc. Even in 1939, out of 86 divisions mustered, uh, 35 of them were already third and fourth wave uh, divisions. So you're already tapping into uh, poor quality troops when the war started. Uh, something that's come up pretty heavily in historiography since then is that uh, the, probably the best comparison of the German army in World War II is that of a spear. Uh, the, the pointy end did all the damage in the early part of the war, but the rest of it's just a stick. Uh, and that is increasingly uh, something that come, a weakness that comes out as the war drags on. And uh, to give you some examples of those uh, of the chaotic organizational mess that uh, has already been uh, introduced in our discussion today. Uh, the uh, Hitler's uh, Hitler's Wehrmacht was very much in the scheme of creating new units rather than maintaining their old ones, especially as the war dragged on. Uh, there's a number of reasons that Hitler wanted to do that. Uh, the biggest single one is that as the war dragged on, he wanted to make sure that the army was loyal to him, uh, and and the units that were created were de were designed around loyalty to Hitler almost more than whether or not they would be effective. Uh, the best examples of that are probably the Waffen SS. Uh, the Volksgrenadier divisions, and especially the Volkssturm, which uh, was created towards the end of the uh, end of the war, basically a citizens' militia that was not effective whatsoever, but supposedly loyal to Hitler. The Luftwaffe field divisions are another unit that can fit into that class. And what you're looking at on the first slide there is the overall deployment, where everybody ended up effectively. Uh, there were 21 of these units deployed throughout the war, and you'll notice they're pretty much everywhere in Europe. So if you're going to look into this subject, you kind of have to know the ETO in its entirety to make this work. Uh, you've got three divisions stationed in, in Western Europe. Uh, they saw action and were destroyed in France. Uh, two more in Italy, one in the Balkans, one in Norway, and everybody else was in the Eastern Front. <clears throat> uh, these divisions were designed mainly as what we might call static units or Bodenstandig, as the Germans would put it. Uh, these were units that were designed to hold the line until reinforcements showed up, uh, especially in the Eastern Front. That's essentially how the German army had to operate. The Panzers were the only mobile reserve they had. Uh, so you had to make sure that you kept your line as sturdy as possible so the Panzers could close any gaps. And the field divisions would absolutely uh, be included in that list. So, uh, returning to our problem of German reserves uh, being gone in 1942, uh, the Luftwaffe, meanwhile, might have a manpower surplus uh, in 1941. Uh, by, by December of 41, there's 1.7 million uh, troops in the Luftwaffe uh, itself, and during that year, they suffered a lot of aircraft losses. Mm -hmm. So the German army was uh, pretty convinced that the Luftwaffe had manpower to spare, and the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations in OKW, Walter Warlemont, uh, is going to convince uh, General Wilhelm Keitel uh, to request 100,000 men from the Luftwaffe to Army custody. And I think I've got them on the next slide here. Let's see. Ah, actually, there's a question we should go ahead and answer before I get to Warlemont. Uh, the catalyst, obviously, we've, talk, we've talked about already. That is the manpower crisis of 41-42. Uh, but there are two other things that are going to be very uh, apparent as we go through this. That chaotic internal tension between German uh, high command, Hitler versus the, versus the army traditions, 
You've got the Nazis versus the traditionalists. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all going to play out for this. Uh, but something that's usually forgotten is that there actually is an existing precedent for Luftwaffe ground units going into 1942. Luftwaffe field divisions are not an anomaly, so to speak. Well, let's rephrase that. They're, it, they're not a new concept to put Luftwaffe ground divisions uh, in there, but these were handled the worst of all of them. So that's probably the best way to put this. So now let's go to the next slide here. There we go. Uh, there is a meeting at OKW, September 12th, 1942. Uh, the major players are pictured and listed on this uh, for you on the slide here. Walter Warlamont is the central figure uh, for this particular meeting because he's the one initiating the call for Luftwaffe troops uh, being tra to be transferred to the Army. He's also requesting about 20,000 men from the, from the Kriegsmarine while we're at it. Uh, at the meeting of September 12th, uh, Warlamont is getting ready to put forward his request to Hitler himself when Hans Jeschenik comes up to him and tells him to uh, get ready for something, is actually the quote. Uh, Warlamont actually has this meeting in his uh, book, the in, uh, Im Hauptquartier uh, der Deutschen Wehrmacht, inside, inside the German High Command, World War II. Uh, if you're familiar with that book, Walter, uh, Warlamont has this meeting in there. This is the source. Uh, and after Jeschenik tells Warlamont basically to back off for a second, Hermann Göring stops into the room, announces that instead of giving his men to the army, he will create his own army divisions and deploy them uh, wherever they will be needed, uh, just to make sure that the Luftwaffe keeps their hands on their troops. It's a, in his mind, it's as simple as that. Uh, the actual quote is he won't let his good national socialists uh, fall into the hands of the reactionary army. Uh, anyone who knows anything about Goring knows he's a bit of a prima donna. Uh, out of all of the cronies of Adolf Hitler, he is definitely someone who plays up uh, the luxury and uh, racketeering and all the other fun stuff that the Nazi leadership did to their own country. Uh, but being that he was still the number two man in the Reich, uh, Hitler is going to go with Goring on this one. Uh, he's going to let Goring create his men. Uh, the other members of OKW President Yodel and Keitel are basically going to let that go. Warlamont's the only one protesting about this. And then, you know, this is going to be obviously a recurring theme, but you know, Goering's ego, Goering, all of these, you know, Yodel, Keitel, there's a power struggle. There's always going to be a power struggle going on. They all want to be considered to be the favorite. They all want to make sure they've got their hand in, at least while the war is going in their favor, perhaps not quite the same way in 1945, but it's going against, against them. But you know, they, they, there's... Uh, this basic principle, there's there's some logic to both ideas. You can you can see that yeah, there's a personnel shortage in the army. There's maybe too many in the Luftwaffe, so we can either move them into the, the army, and that's and the British did that with a big contingent of um, RAF regiment going into I think it, the Irish Guards in 1944, but not I say big. It wasn't tens of thousands; it was hundreds. Mm -hmm. So that that kind of makes sense. You could take them and put them in to an existing unit, but it also sort of makes sense that if Goring knows his personnel, that having his own units. You could make that sales pitch work at, at that meeting. I could, I can see how that works. As we will find out with you later, Michael, it doesn't really work. But I can kind of understand how, if you pitch it in the right way, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it, it, eventually, obviously, we are going to point that this was that this is going to be a very large mistake. But uh, when Goering announced it, he did have actual successes on the on the Luftwaffe's record that is exactly in keeping with what he's about to try to do. Right. Uh, this is just the biggest attempt at it for that the throughout the entire war. Okay, so uh, let's get the next slide here. All right, so five days after the meeting, Gehring is going to create uh, the divisions. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than I expected it to be on this one, but basically the message is calling for volunteers within the Luftwaffe. Uh, at least ninety percent of the troops that join this these units actually volunteered to be there. Uh, unfortunately, to their peril, but. Uh, uh, Gehring's message basically was calling for volunteers. You'll be covered with glory. You know, it's, it's one of the motivational call, you know, call for volunteer messages that ever comes out. Uh, it's not going to go their way. That's the, that's the basic bit here. Uh, so let's go to our next slide and we'll start to see how this, uh, also comes about. Uh, this is the slide we've been sort of hinting at the entire time so far. Uh, there's the internal tensions among the German, among the German high command, 
that we've seen not just in many videos on this channel, but also in historiography as a whole. Uh, just for this clip, you have the Nazi Luftwaffe versus the so-called reactionary army, traditionalist army. Uh, Hitler uh, was very much opposed to the Prussian edition of the general staff and also army traditionalists as a whole. Uh, he himself was a foot soldier in World War I. You have a, it's kind of the, a, a version of the soldier versus commander mentality that you sometimes get in an army. Uh, Hitler spent most of the war undermining the general staff. Uh, he puts his own people in place. Uh, he does his best to get rid of independently minded officers in favor of yes men. Uh, ultimately, by the end of the war, he is going to sideline everything that used to make the German army Prussian and make it his own. Uh, when it says Nazification of the German army during the war, uh, what I mean by that isn't just so much high command, but also that Nazi ideology will be slowly seeping into the uh, regular German forces as we go through as well. Uh, historians such as Omar Bartov, uh, Stephen Fritz, and Ben Shepard have all pointed this out. Uh, basically, as the German army took more and more casualties, more and more officers uh, f uh, fell on, in, on all fronts, uh, the German army ended up being held together by, at the end by Nazi ideology. A lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of that didn't end up becoming, uh, sorry, I, I'm going to just re rewind everything I just said. I lost my train of thought there for a second. No, I do it all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, the bottom line here is that Hitler is more focused on loyal, the loyalty of the German army, uh, maybe even more so than the effectiveness of it. We certainly see that after the events of July 20, 1944, uh, with, uh, with the Valkyrie plot. Uh, but at the same time, he's been working on making the German army a Nazi organization pretty much the whole time he's in power. Going all the way back to 1933, he's already putting his people in place. And while the, the army may have supported Hitler's rise to power, because in some ways they did want some of what he did, uh, that re those relations started cooling pretty fast. Right. I just got to want to ask you to clarify something, because we have people asking about the fact <clears throat> this original meeting was OKW, but was the original uh, suggestion to find um, troops for the Western Front and the Eastern Front, or just the Western Front, but then move the Eastern Front? Was it just the OKW was having the meeting on behalf of both fronts, just... Can you just clarify why it was OKW? Uh, it was OKH, technically, originally in the request, which, which meant it was for the, the Eastern Front by itself. Uh, it had to go through OKW because of the power uh, structure that existed. OKW is the top dog. The other three branches, Navy, Marines, or sorry, Navy, Air Force, Army, uh, uh, all basically were competing with each other at that level, and then everything had to go through Hitler. Okay. So Warlamont was meeting with Hitler to get to get this thing passed through and Gehring decided to turn it on its head. Perfect. Understood. Right. Yes. Uh, all that aside, uh, with the, uh, the, the tensions between the Luftwaffe, the army, Hitler and the general staff, the Nazis and the traditionalists, uh, the Luftwaffe is an example of one of the branches that was important for Nazi loyalty. Uh, cause it is an independent branch of the military. Hitler wanted to make sure that it stayed independent. Uh, not just so it could do more of what it needed to do, but also so the Nazis could keep a better hold on it. And outside, I mean, it, the, basically what it meant is that uh, when the war started, the Luftwaffe was pretty much the only branch of the German military that was outside the traditional Prussian tradition, the army and military together. Uh, this is obviously going to explode as the, as the war drags on. Uh, but it also is going to... Uh, do quite a bit of a number on the LF on the Luftwaffe field divisions themselves. Mm. So uh, let's go to our next slide here. Yeah, and, and this is when people gonna, have already been asking in the sidebar about Falschmeier and how that connects with this. Um, and again, this is you're going to this is where it all starts getting complicated and overly so. You know that the the branches, the tree split and split and split, and this idea of exactly who's in charge of what that was an eternal eternal problem for the Third Reich. Exactly. Uh, and honestly, the slide you're looking at could be a book uh, for any yeah. historians who are looking out on that, because uh, Luftwaffe had an astoundingly large sized ground force that was already in service before September 42. Uh, by the end of the war, uh, counting 22 Luftwaffe field divisions, you have 10 Fallschirmjäger divisions, 31 Flak divisions, the Hermann Goering division, which eventually becomes a, a full Panzer Corps. 
uh, not to mention a wide variety of security, technical, and auxiliary uh, formations that are formed for ver a variety of purposes. Uh, best estimate, the Luftwaffe mustered 70 divisions by itself, uh, which is a ridiculous amount of manpower for the German Air Force. And all of it, remember, not in Army hands. Uh, and while many of them served with the Army, it wasn't technically uh, it wasn't technically under uh, Army control. Uh, something that's going to, again, uh, play a role as we go forward here. Uh, so paratroopers, flak divisions, a lot of folks who are interested in World War II have probably got at least a picture of what all these units are. The Hermann Goering Division is something that a lot of folks have probably heard of. Uh, so just for the sake of time and brevity, I'm not going to go too much into the Paras, the Flak, and the and Hermann Goering, uh, because it's the last thing on this slide that almost no one has heard of. Uh, and the very first example of these security detachments uh, is a German word called Alarmeinheiten, or, or emergency unit, essentially. Uh, they served predominantly a security uh, role on the Eastern Front, but also they definitely con uh, conducted anti-partisan activity on the Eastern Front as well. Uh, this, the Alarmeinheiten are one of the groups of units that are conducting atrocities behind the lines. Mm. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is actually going to be where we start seeing the ancestors of the Luftwaffe Field Divisions take place. Uh, the, uh, during the winter crisis of 1941, Alarm and Heighten are actually responsible for defending a number of points along the border. Uh, the biggest one, uh, well, one, not, not the biggest one, one of the more notable ones in this instance uh, is an air base at the town of Yuknov, uh, which was defended essentially by an ad hoc, ad hoc battle group of a whole bunch of different units. And under the command of a general by the name of Eugen Meindl, who is going to keep cropping up as we go forward, because he's the one who actually... Uh, forms and trains the Luftwaffe field divisions. Uh, it's because he's got experience doing this exact thing. Uh, slapped a bunch of units together, made them work together, and they held off the Red Army for a few weeks. Uh, to go along with some other uh, uh, some other uh, units under Luftwaffe command, uh, one of the big ones, uh, one of the more uh, interesting ones, actually, Gehring being uh, the Reich's chief huntsman, uh, one of his other titles, uh, was also the head of the Reich Forestry Department, yeah. uh, which ultimately is going to engage uh, in the same anti-partisan activities that I mentioned for the alarm I'd heightened. I actually, I see Phil Blood's name being listed a lot in the comments. Uh, I actually uh, used a, 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 both an article and a book of his uh, to help me write my dissertation because uh, he had actually addresses these units in question. Yeah, and, and about the only one to have done it in a mainstream way. Any, any, I will always take all and any praise for Dr. Philip Blood because he's one of our absolute, and I use the word national treasure there, and he may go red hearing that, but honestly, he really is an incredible, incredible historian. Yes. Uh, um the forestry department was going to be paired up with additional Luftwaffe units. There's actually a unit called the Luftwaffe Security Battalion or Sicherungsbataillon, uh, which eventually becomes uh, what's called the Jäger Sonderkommando Bialowice der Luftwaffe or JSKB, uh, which is serving in the Bialowice Forest uh, in eastern Poland. Uh, these units are committing atrocities and genocide behind the lines. They're targeting par uh, partisans. They're targeting... Uh, any Jews they find for, for sure. This is all going to be roped into Holocaust uh, atrocities. Uh, but again, all under Luftwaffe command. Uh, so definitely something to consider here. Now, to get us to the true ancestors of the Luftwaffe field divisions, we need to bump to our next slide here. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of conversation about uh, General Meindl, so there's a picture of him. Uh, Eugen Meindl, if you've if you've heard of him before, you've either heard of him for this or he, you've heard him for one or one of two other things. He was uh, a major player in the Battle of Crete, uh, which may be where you've seen him, Operation Mercury. Uh, he also was commander of the 2nd Fallschirmjäger Division in Normandy. Uh, so uh, odds are you've probably seen him there. Uh, but in this case, uh, we come to something that starts up in very early 1941, the formation of what are called Luftwaffe Field Battalions, and also field, uh, those battalions eventually become regiments. Uh, basically, the, this is a dress re rehearsal of that meeting on September 12th. The German Luftwaffe called for volunteers to assist the army uh, in, in holding the Eastern Front, and a lot of guys decided to do that. 
uh, there's a couple dozen of these battalions across the Eastern Front. They get merged into, I think, seven separate regiments after a while, and they'll be uh, essentially scattered all across the Eastern Front wherever they were needed. Two of the biggest pockets where you'll see these, though, are the cities of Demyansk and Kolm. Let's jump to the next slide just for a second here, because uh, I got them both right on this slide. Uh, Demyansk is that big blue circle kind of right in the middle, uh, Second Army Corps being surrounded by the Soviets for a few months. Uh, but if you look way down to the bottom of the map next to the key, you can see the little town of Kolm, uh, defended by Kampfgruppe Shira. There are Luftwaffe troops in both of these locations. Uh, moreover, the very first Luftwaffe field division is actually going to help break the siege of these two locations, uh, so which is why I'm focusing so, uh, so much on them here. Uh, let's back a slide to the Mindel slide. Uh, We've already met Mindel in passing, but this is where we really start seeing what he's uh, what he becomes known for uh, in the year 1942. He's after scrapping a bunch of, of troops together to defend Yuknov, uh, he ends up being uh, in charge of four of these Luftwaffe field regiments. Uh, it forms his own unit on uh, Feb February 29th, 1942. He, he uh, creates what's called Division Mindel. Uh, that division will eventually be redesignated the 21st Luftwaffe Field Division. So this is actually the very first of the uh, units that we'll be talking about for the rest of the day. Uh, division Mindel is uh, not some slapdash unit that we're going to be like we're going to be talking about later on. Uh, these Luftwaffe volunteers were actually trained for infantry combat. They had at least three, four weeks of training, which isn't much, but it's more than some of the Luftwaffe divisions are going to have. Uh, and they're being trained by uh, their fellow paratroopers, actually. Uh, so Luftwaffe personnel are training Luftwaffe personnel, but it's actually for military combat. Uh, Division Mindel uh, is going to essentially protect the right flank of the relief effort that uh, will break the siege of Demyansk and Kolm. And then after the, those pockets are, are relieved, uh, Division Mindel essentially stays in the 90-mile gap between those two cities until 1944. Uh, the, that division holds that position for the next two years. Uh, and eventually it'll be included in the overall mix of the Luftwaffe Field Division. So uh, this is a Luftwaffe Field Division. It was formed, it was trained, it saw action, and it apparently did a pretty good job. Even OKW is issuing uh, uh, rec recognition for what this guy was, this group of uh, uh, what Mindel and his uh, group was able to do. Uh, so until now, Luftwaffe of ground divisions a pure conceivable thing. This could yes. theoretically work. Uh, one of the uh, things we're going to be seeing as we go forward is the whole question of troop quality and something we've been kind of hinting at the whole time so far. Uh, in the hierarchy of the German military, Luftwaffe, they don't get the top picks uh, for recruits. That usually goes to the Waffen SS. But Luftwaffe is usually getting the second best uh, recruits. So these are, you know, how you can say good quality raw recruits. Um, so if you train them right, according to everything we've seen so far today, there's no reason that shouldn't work. And, and Mindel's division in this early era could have, I could think you could almost liken it to like the seaborne element of a British airborne division. In that they're kind of still under the umbrella of the elite aspect of it being airborne. So in this case, Fauci maker. So they're, that kind of ethos and esprit de corps is rubbing off. As you said there, they're being trained by the NCOs and the officers of this existing parachute. So you can this is this is this is under the umbrella of a of a decent unit, as opposed to as we're going to be discovering later on, it becomes a very separate and it loses all that connection with the voucher maker, loses all that connection with Mindel, who was a very you know resourceful guy. I mean, I'm thinking about him. As you said, the Normandy campaign in the Falaise Gap, you know, doing these insurgent things, they're keeping the gap open, they you know, allowing uh, tank divisions to escape and SS divisions. You know, he, he's kind of, he's a kind of a not a master tactician, but he knows what he's doing. He's he's got he's he's one of the in the in the better the better half of the German commanders, not the worse half. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, at this point now, from, from if you're trying to be objective, you can see this idea if it continues on this level has some value. It has some potential of. You're taking personnel from somewhere where there may be too many. As you said there, they're possibly the second best group of, of, re, of recruits going to the military, and they've proved their worth to some extent in combat. So at this point there, the, kind of the plan sounds solid. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a, 
a couple of questions I just want to address right now, actually. Um, one of the ones that I'm seeing here uh, is how are these Luftwaffe units equipped? Not very well. Uh, yes, um, uh, Mr. Carr there. Uh, not very well at all. These are predominantly rifle units. Every unit I've talked about uh, so far tonight is predominantly rifles, maybe some automatic weapons, and a very light artillery combatant. Even, at, even as effective as it was, Division Minel never had proper artillery until it became a Luftwaffe field division. Right. Uh, uh, and even then, it was lighter than it probably should have. Uh, but up until now, I mean, what what is common up till now in this presentation is about to become an anomaly once we start talking about the other 21 of these units, because uh, this is where everything starts going pretty much to hell in a handbasket. Uh, let's uh, bump to our next slide here. Oh, sorry. One more. That, that one, one more. Here we go. There we are. Uh, so. Uh, at this point, September 17th, 1942, the rest of the divisions are announced, uh, and the army reaction to these divisions is about as about as what you would expect. Uh, what they're hearing is the Luftwaffe is going to create their own infantry units, uh, train them themselves, equip them themselves, and somehow help the army. I don't know a single army officer, aside from Yodel and Keitel, that agreed with that sentiment. Uh, uh, at least I have not read an example of one that actually did. Uh, some of the um, more telling examples I could find in my research, uh, the author F.W. von Mellenthin, who wrote the book Panzer Battles about 50, 60 years ago, uh, in that book he mentioned that these divisions were given excellent human material and, quote, the best equipment, we'll find that's a lie later, uh, but commanded by men who knew nothing of land fighting. And, and, you know, these are Luftwaffe officers, not paratroop officers commanding these units. These are airmen that are training airmen, but as infantry. And that is not an equation that's going to work. Uh, Eric von Manstein has a much more uh, uh, simple quote about this. He simply said this was sheer lunacy. Uh, there's no way this would have worked. Uh, if you read Manstein's uh, uh, Lost Victories uh, memoirs, uh, he also discusses the Luftwaffe divisions in there. Uh, the the meeting that we saw with Warlamont and Gehring and such uh, several slides back, Monstein is uh, was one of the first people Warlamont contacted after that meeting. Uh, so Warlamont gave him the scoop. This is how this happened, and Monstein has an appropriate response. Uh, my personal favorite example is actually from one of the divisions themselves, an, a Luftwaffe officer, General Alfred Manka, whose memoir uh, for Kaiser and Hitler was just translated into English maybe 10 years ago and published. You can find this guy's memoirs. Uh, Manka is only around a Luftwaffe division for a few pages of his book uh, and a few weeks of real life, uh, but he was the com original commanding officer of the 15th Luftwaffe Field Division. And despite being a Luftwaffe officer who had only served for a few months in an infantry battalion back in 1917, uh, he... He took the job, you know, he, he says, this is an infantry division, I will do my damnedest and see what happens. Uh, but in his memoir, he uh, says that these units were a concession to Gehring's vanity and they were a botched attempt from the start. And we're going to see his unit as one of the ones that was more badly botched. Uh, Maka is maybe responsible for the, or maybe the original commander of this unit, but uh, uh, he's not going to be around when the 15th actually sees action. Uh, so he'll be there for the organization, but then someone else is going to have to deal with the actual deployment of it. But all in all, not a good first step. So we're uh, already seeing how this is going to start going going problematic. Uh, let's go to the next slide. General Mindel was put in charge of organizing and training all of the Luffa Field Division. So far, that seems like a good choice. Uh, he's done that twice already in the last several months. Uh, and done a good job both times, as far as the records can say. Uh, but he's immediately stuck in a very uh, frustrating situation. He was promised resources, he was promised time, and, and OKW and Hitler didn't give him any of that. Um, quoting him right below the right below his name there on the slide, once one of these divisions had been formed but in no way trained, it was transferred and committed. I fought against this, but it was in vain, as were all my warnings. He wanted three months to train the units. He got three weeks, if he was lucky. Uh, the first divisions were uh, this. The divisions were ordered on September seventeenth. The first divisions were deployed on October tenth. Uh, so that's three weeks to get these units together and actually train them, and then deploy them. 
Uh, there's an, a recruit from the seventh Luftwaffe field division. What horror! My comrades had no idea about weapons. Even some of the officers did not. That same guy, uh, the unnamed recruit, uh, was apparently put in charge of machine gun training because his commander didn't know what he was doing on those, and they were deployed three days after he started training the men on those guns. Uh, this is uh, pretty much in keeping with every single example I can find of what happened with these units. Uh, they were trained for war, but the wrong kind. They, these were these were Luftwaffe personnel. They were they had basic training. They had uh, at least the ability to serve in a military branch, but they were not trained for what they were about to do. And essentially, what's going to happen is they're going to be shoved a rifle and then thrown against Russian tanks. Which, I mean, just to jump in there, I mean, by this point of the war. The, the, the Germans are seeing that that kind of thing is happening with the Red Army and, and, and that sending people in with no training just doesn't really work. So why, why, are, they not, why are they not giving these units longer to get to, together? Why, I mean, is there a reason for it? Just vanity, stupidity, lack of organization, lack of foresight, desperation, a bit of all of that? I'd actually say all of that, yeah. Uh, Gehring wanted these units together. Hitler wanted them on the front line. The army needed reinforcements. Uh, it became a rush job to get the first 10 of these divisions deployed. They were all out uh, by November 1st. So that's between two and six weeks training for the first 10 of these divisions. Uh, the others uh, were uh, comparably longer trained, but uh, we'll see others' problems uh, doing them in as we go. And we've had a question, uh, Michael, about what type of organic transportation they have. Well, if they're, if they're not being trained in, in basic tactics, and I can assume not very much is going to be the answer to that. Yeah, quite literally organic transportation. Uh, average uh, mobility for these units was foot, bike, or horse. That was it. They didn't really have anything in, uh, in the way of uh, uh, mechanized transport. Uh, just to compare uh, how these units were actually uh, put together, I've got my stats somewhere. Here they are. Uh, on paper... Uh, the Luftwaffe Field Division was weaker than a Soviet rifle division uh, on, on paper, on average. It, it varied by unit. These were not standard not standardized units. We had some divisions that were under 6,000 men, some that were over 10. Uh, just kind of luck of the draw, basically, depending on how big a certain Luftwaffe division got. Uh, but on paper, it, uh, just to give you some numbers here, a Soviet rifle division was about 11,000 men, about a third of which had automatic weapons access, uh, about 600 machine guns, 50 tanks, 100 pieces of artillery, 70 anti-aircraft guns, and over 1,000 other vehicles attached to that unit. That's a on-paper strength of a rifle division. Anyone who looks in the Russian army will tell you there's a big asterisk you have to put on that because of loss of sustain, but still, that's the on-paper strength. Uh Whereas for a Luftwaffe field division, you're under 10,000 men, almost all of whom were armed with rifles. Uh, for the division, they had 500 machine guns, maybe 20 pieces of artillery, a varying number of anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons, 2,000 horses, and 200 bicycles. Right. That's it. And, you know, and these divisions are going to be hit by multiple Soviet units every time they're attacked on the front line. And we're just we're being reminded by Gary that, that, that this autumn 42 period is when the Germans are holding the longest front line they're ever going to hold in the war. And so I can understand the, the desperations. But this is begging the question that's probably going to become, if it doesn't come for you, it's going to come for me, is that you've got personnel who are not trained up. Why can't they be used to be, replace the losses in, in uh, conventional here in, in units right in the front? You know, they're, they're suffering losses. So why can't you filter these guys in by the 100 or 200 of existing divisions? Would that not have been, I mean, obviously they're getting a certain amount of reinforcements through the army anyway, but wouldn't that have been a better a better use of this manpower? And then also have to, you, you, you could, you, you're avoiding the training problem in that they kind of get their training in the field from those around. It's not perfect, yeah. but surely it's better than sending out an entire division that hasn't been trained properly. You would think that would be the idea, but uh, it's not what they did, unfortunately. Uh, uh, the system that you're, that you're saying about maintaining existing units, uh, the, that's ex exactly what the U.S. Army basically did to replenish itself. Yeah, during yeah, the war. Yeah. Same divisions in the field just kept filling them with replacements. Uh, for the Luftwaffe, though, that uh, we actually do have an answer to why they didn't just piecemeal the guys where they were needed, and that's because they would have still had to give these troops to the Army. And Gehring did not want that to happen at this point. When uh, there's going to be a year of fighting uh, where the, the divisions are in action from September 44, September 42 to September 43, a whole bunch of stuff is going to go wrong. And 
uh, Mindel himself is going to start cropping up solutions. One of the solutions he, he, he wants to do is to consolidate the troops into a smaller number of units and send the excess to replenish other forces in the line. He specifically wants to retrain, retrain these guys as paratroop replacements. Uh, that's not going to happen, though. We'll see why. All right. Are we ready to move on now? I think we... Yes. Uh, there is... Uh, yes, this one here. Uh, so we've already seen the training failure. Uh, these are Luftwaffe officers training infantry and infantry tactics that they themselves are not trained with. We understand why this is a problem. Uh, we've seen that there's equipment disparities. Uh, I mentioned that they had some artillery in these units. Almost all of it is captured. And my personal favorite example, going back to the 15th Luftwaffe Division, the one that uh, General Manka commanded a few slides back, uh, their artillery com uh, component was apparently uh, 19th century French bronze barrel cannons that were taken from local museums in the area. Good grief. Yeah. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't get much more outdated than that. A lot of the other you know, units, even Division Mindel, one of the better uh, divisions that will be deployed here, uh, they're still out uh, equipped pretty much predominantly with captured Russian equipment. Uh, there, there's, there's not a whole lot of standardized Wehrmacht stuff in these units, uh, at least in terms of artillery. Uh, in terms of strength, uh, you can see understrength units. The average German infantry division was uh, nine battalions and three regiments. The average Luftwaffe division was four to six battalions. So we're talking brigade, brigade strength, maybe. Right. Uh, there were some divisions that were as low as four battalions, though. So you think you have a division, but you only have half the men that you're thinking of. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, where it says under strength as well. Uh, not only are the artillery and manpower problematic, uh, we've gone over the fact that the, that these units on paper were, were weaker than a Soviet division. They're certainly uh, weaker than any other of the uh, uh, any of the other uh, Allied powers that they could have fought or they could and will fought as we go forward. Uh, there are a few, very few Luftwaffe divisions that do well in combat. We're not going to meet them really till the end of this. Uh, Division Mindel is one of them, but the rest of them, you can already see how this is going to go. Uh, the last step in, uh, that really is going to undermine what's going to happen here. Oops, sorry, my cat's deciding to play uh, header with my computer here. Uh, so I uh, apologize, Internet, if you see his tail. Uh, but the logistics uh, situation is even worse than you can think of. Uh, logistics in the German army is already barely adequate as is. Uh, but because that these units were still part of the Luftwaffe, their logistics system is different than that of the army. They're, out, they're actually two separate systems that are trying to commingle with each other. So even though these are deployed between army units on the front line, they have the same uh, supply officers might be going to different in different paths depending on what's going on. Uh, so the Luftwaffe divisions don't have dedicated uh, logistics uh, uh, routes for themselves. And very importantly, that means that they don't have a real route to replace losses they sustain in combat. So if you lose people, that's probably it uh, until your division is eventually destroyed. Uh, most Luftwaffe divisions as we're going to see is, are just going to be whittled down to nothing. And then whatever is left is going to be contributed to another nearby unit, uh, either another Luftwaffe division uh, or a Volksgrenadier unit or someone else nearby who needs the troops. Uh, it's actually one of the biggest reasons why finding uh, archival sources on these units is so hard, it, why it's so hard to find sources of these things. Uh, one Luftwaffe division might end up being three or four other units. And you'll have a few months where you're a Luftwaffe division, but then you won't exist anymore. And if you want to track the same guy, you're going to have to find a different unit to trace really where he went. Uh, it, it's a very chaotic setup that we have here. And our, and our wise viewers are realizing that with separate logistics systems, you, you, you couldn't make this up, how, how this organizes. And it is interesting. We're doing this on the 80th anniversary of Barbarossa, the anniversary of Barbarossa, 81st. Um, but, you know, you've got, because yeah, out there, you've got Romanian elements, Italian, Hungarian, SS, Waffen SS, here, Luftwaffe, for, for, for Luftwaffe air units and Luftwaffe ground units and Fauschermega. And is there anything else I haven't mentioned? All effectively, you trying to fight for the same limited amount of resources, the same the same freight on the same railway lines with disorganized systems, with the rank structures of all these supply officers not knowing quite who's in charge of what because you get the there's a SS major outrank and army major all that kind. Of, it's just an absolute logistical nightmare, and you can understand how it's it's only going to get worse. It's yes. only going to get worse. Yeah, and to give you just an example of what this uh, system would, would look like, it's not just a logistics problem, it's also a command issue, too. 
Yeah. These units were still under Luftwaffe command. Uh, it's a different front, but they still had Luftwaffe divisions involved. Um, uh, Albert Kesselring, uh, uh, commanding officer in Italy, uh, while he was a Luftwaffe officer, while he had full supreme command of the troops in Italy, if he wanted to move a flak division from one point to another, he would have to go through the Luftwaffe to do it, even if that unit was attached to an army unit. Uh, and that same uh, that same it, communications issues will take place with the Luftwaffe divisions as well. But, but you know, Kesselring came up in the side, but but what Kesselring can achieve because of Kesselring being Kesselring is very different to someone who's further down the chain of a command. If you're a major or a colonel, I mean Kesselring, yeah, he's kind of a one phone call kind of guy, isn't he? As you say, he's he's just about successfully straddling the army and Luffa because he's he's effectively both, isn't he? Sort of, yeah. So so what he can achieve in Italy is is not going to be the same as you know some some divisional commander out in uh, in the eastern front who's going to be on the phone if there's a phone line operating to, to try and get what he wants it's yeah it's staggeringly incompetent yes uh, this is actually it, when i looked into this this was, the, this was the most incompetent i've ever seen a lot of the german army stuff that i had read up till that point uh, in, in my life uh, i've seen some worse examples since then but a different topic for a different time uh bottom line here is oh. you made a good point then i'll let Karen back to you say that the reason he's saying is that they couldn't have been used as individual replacements for the army units is quite simple morale and the issue of socially into socially integration of them into army infantry squads would have been a worse disaster that's an interesting point there is that it it wouldn't have worked in the same streamlined way that we were referring to the u.s army there where these you know the, the, the green horns coming off the boat would just phase into whichever division it would be the 28th division or the first and it would all be kind of almost seamless and within a few weeks they'd become veterans themselves that they he's jimmy's i get i was interested in your opinion is suggesting that 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 wouldn't have been as 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 the easier thing to achieve but moving people from the luftwaffe to the army uh that potentially could have been an issue uh absolutely uh i'm not sure if it's wor a worse disaster than the, the divisions you know not being equipped not being trained and thrown to the wolves but uh it absolutely would have been a problem but it would have been the same problem as or, or, uh, getting replacements into any military unit uh and it, i'd say the u.s is you know the u.s had its problems with their replacement system during world war ii but uh it, it, well, it's kind of comparing apples and oranges to compare the U.S. system uh, of replenishing existing units yeah, yeah. and also uh, the German system of create new ones. And hopefully the other ones can be merged or don't die immediately. Yeah. Uh, bottom line here, the last line in the slide here, uh, there were 200,000 personnel in the divisions when they de were deployed. Uh, they suffered a 45 percent casualty rate in the first year of action. Uh, and that's actually lower than you might expect, to be honest. Uh, the only reason it's a lower one is because not everybody saw action the first year. So that was essentially right. it. Uh, the okay. divisions that saw action, most of them were cut to pieces. All right. But so time to move on to our to our first notable action. Yes. Uh, Got to cut some of these guys to pieces. So uh, our very first divisions in uh, action were the 7th and 8th, which were uh, actually part of Monstein's effort to relieve Stalingrad, which is uh, codenamed Operation Winterstorm or uh, Wintergewitter, if you're looking for the German word. Uh the seventh and the eighth were deployed to the to the front line. Uh, they were they tried advancing forward with the rest of Monstein's forces. They ended up running into Russian tanks. Both of them were mauled beyond recognition. Uh, the eighth was pushed back. You can see on the right hand side where all those red arrows are going. One of them is heading to the air base at Tatsinskaya, uh, which is the main Luftwaffe air base to that was trying to resupply Stalingrad. This is the airport that's trying to give the relief effort uh, by air to Stalingrad. Uh, the divisions that were defending Tatsinskaya uh, were the 8th Luftwaffe and also the 15th Luftwaffe. Uh, and they were going to be up against, uh, starting on December 24th, excuse me, 24th, 1942, we have the Russian 24th Tank Corps uh, that overran Tatsinskaya by blasting through the two Luftwaffe divisions defending the airfield. They destroyed something like 70 transport aircraft, uh, seriously hampered the Stalingrad relief effort. And to give you an idea on how equipped the Luftwaffe divisions were, uh, were going to be able to possibly stop this attack, the 15th didn't have its artillery yet. Those 19th century French guns didn't exist yet. <laughs> they didn't, at this point, they had no artillery. Uh, and the 8th uh, were, had lost so many of its he heavy weapons that the only quote-unquote heavy equipment they had were 20-millimeter guns they scrounged off of fighter planes. 
uh, that's what they were throwing at the at the Russian tanks that were coming in on the airbase. Uh, it's very easy to see why these divisions were swept were swept aside. Mm. Wow. Uh, the set, uh, normally, when you look through World War II sources, whether that's uh, Gerhard Weimar's World in Arms or any of the big volume histories of World War II, the seventh and the eighth division or Luftwaffe are the two divisions that get singled out the most because uh, they were the first ones to see action and the first ones to fail miserably. Uh, Monstein singles these two out because they were under his command. Uh, a few other generals do that as well. Uh, I see a question about the volunteer percentage being uh, being a, a drop after such high casualty rates. Uh, you'll see that eventually, but uh, uh, we'll also see some other troops uh, join these units uh, thanks to the Army. So we'll, we'll see how this plays out. Uh, going to our next slide, though, I wanted to save the worst for, for, for next. Uh, the entire reputation of all these units can be summed up in the second uh, Luftwaffe Field Division, uh, which by its own history calls itself the luckless unit or the gutless unit, depending on who you're reading. Uh, this division was assigned to Army Group Center, uh, where it ends up uh, caught in the Rejev salient and ends up being targeted by the Soviet Operation Mars. And while Operation Mars is remembered today as Zhukov's greatest defeat, didn't look that way to these guys when it started off. Uh, it's kind of hard to place them on the map here, but if you see, uh, there's the the main front line where the salient is, and then there's the other uh, line where they're where the Soviets were trying to go. Right above that, you see that the first of these little pockets uh, uh, near the town of Belly. Uh, the second Luftwaffe is just south of Belly, uh, lined up with a couple of infantry divisions. Uh, when the Russians launched their attack on November 25th of 1942, uh, the, the second Luftwaffe was shattered almost instantly. They faced 15 Russian divisions that were coming, that were incoming in, uh, on their position and uh, essentially broke and ran. Uh, very light manpower losses, but they lost almost all of their equipment when they fled. Uh, now, the actual Soviet attack was thwarted by German armor, uh, but this unit was blamed for the break in the line. So they wanted to get themselves, the Germans wanted to get this unit away from the salient. So they shipped out the second and sent them even further north uh, with three other Luftwaffe divisions. I unfortunately don't have a map for this, uh, but it's up towards the, the city of Neville, uh, which is actually the basically the, the borderline between army groups north and center. Uh, and between those two army groups, you have a Luftwaffe group defending. Uh, four divisions uh, as a link. Uh, the Soviets are going to attack Neville in October of 1943. Uh, again, the second is going to take the brunt of the assault. And again, they are going to simply break and ran. I actually have numbers on this one. Uh, 722 uh, man uh, manpower losses for the division, but they lost 3,000 rifles, uh, 70 pieces of artillery, and all of their anti-aircraft guns. Uh, which, just based on the equipment losses alone, essentially means they threw their weapons down and ran away, which is not wow. a moment you normally see for any German unit, let alone one of these. Uh, it's so bad for the second Luftwaffe that the German allies in the area are condemning how bad this unit is. Uh, it, it's, it, we know how, how, how low the Germans thought of their allied forces. It's bad when the Romanians are telling you that you're bad. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And wow. yeah, and where it says Goering is furious on here, I mean, these were this was his idea. These are his guys, and they're making him look like an idiot, uh, and he knows it. Uh, and this particular incident uh, that I, we talked about, not just with uh, Belgi, but more importantly, Neville, uh, is actually going to be playing a role as to why the army is going to eventually take control of these units. Uh, the, the the defeat at Neville is actually a big reason for that. Um, let's make sure I don't have any more early system nope don't have anything so uh let's go to our next slide here so so the, this is the damning report isn't it this is yes. the this is the illustration that this has just not been a, a, a great success and that's uh, uh yeah. yeah yeah uh mindel issued a report on may 15th of 43 uh where he indicates that morale is obviously very low in these units uh, the field division personnel feel like sacrificial pawns to Goering's vanity. That's actually a direct quote from the report. Uh, the fact that even German allies are scorning what these divisions can do in action. Uh, Mindel's very blunt about why these units are failing. They were thrown into combat without adequate training or leadership. 
Uh, the logistics problems made the ca uh, casualties not being made good, uh, so nothing was being replenished, replenished with losses. Uh, and in the same report, Mindel is going to make suggestions to improve these things. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, he wanted to consolidate consolidate the surviving divisions into a smaller number. That was his first step. Uh, and then whatever was left, transfer them uh, to training regiments to, so they can resupply the Fulcher Major units. Uh, he basically wants to try to make these units actually trained. That, that's that's his essential su uh, suggestion. There's other Luftwaffe and other Army personnel that actually also make uh, suggestions on these. Uh, it's all in the same vein, basically retrain, consolidate, take these guys off the line and reorganize. Uh, the problem is that to remove at this point would be 19 surviving units uh, from the front line is almost impossible. You know, this is a lot of divisions you, and a lot of men you're yanking off the front line. The Germans don't have the resources to do that. Uh, so in order to pull 20 divisions off the front line and retrain them, you're going to have to ask Hitler for, to help with that. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see what Hitler's thoughts on that were. And just to jump in again now, I mean, one of the things when you look at, you know, my knowledge of Normandy comes in here is that sometimes there can be a unit where no one's quite sure why they're not performing. And so therefore it's like, do we change the leadership? Is it something about that? I'm thinking about the 90th, the US 90th division of their first few weeks in Normandy, you know, but at least with this situation, it's clear what was going wrong. They're clearly under-trained uh, and under-equipped and, and under-resourced. So it's not like, there's a mystery about why they're why they're underperforming. You can see exactly what the problem is. So therefore, there is a solution you can come to. So I mean, I can, you know, and I'm sure there's other viewers watching who can think of other units that even today inexplicably underperformed in a certain campaign. Ago. We still don't quite know why that unit did as, didn't do as better than they did, or or conversely, why a unit did perhaps better than the, than they than they should have done. But this seems so clear cut. It just seems that the solution is there. So here we're coming into a solution now. Yeah. Well, what they hope is a solution. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Hitler by so September seventeenth, forty three, forty two is when these divisions were created. By twenty September of forty three, basically a year later. Uh, Hitler's had enough, and he schedules the army to take control of these of all reigning Luftwaffe field divisions on November 1st of 1943, which gives the Luftwaffe about six weeks to maybe change his mind. Uh, so they come up with all these suggestions and they start throwing them at the Fuhrer. But then in October of 43, right between the dates, we have the second division being just basically run off, run out of town at Neville, uh, which ends the debate, and the army is going to take control of these units in November. So, uh, and the army, you know, is going to attempt to make these units better than they are. It's, the army obviously can see what's wrong with these things. Uh, and the first step for their, you can see the word reforms is in quotes. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, the first thing they do is replace all of the Luftwaffe officers with army ones, which is a good first step. You know, that, yeah. that on paper is a good step. You know, get the guys in charge yeah. down and they know what they're doing. Uh, they're going to supply reinforcements to all the divisions. Uh, and just for Army's sake, they're also going to redesignate the units. This is actually another reason why it's kind of hard to find these things is because they have two different unit designations as the war goes on. Uh, you have your LWFD, like you've been seeing so far. Uh, the Army designation is FDL. Uh, so I'll be using them interchangeably from here on out because it's it's a lot to keep track of, but uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, so on paper... The army is doing the right thing, you know. Get them better troops. Try and get them more more training. Uh, but in actuality, the reforms that they're putting in place may not actually do what, what they want to do. Uh, the better officers is going to improve things, but there's no time to train. Uh, they're not being taken off the line to reorganize. They're being reorganized in place. Uh, the reinforcements that these divisions are all getting are poor quality. Uh, we're talking older recruits that or wounded that shouldn't be fighting, or in many cases, uh, Russian uh, and captured Russian uh, Hiwis or Hilsvillige, the sort of prisoner, the prisoner soldiers that you sometimes see deployed uh, across the German army. Uh, these are often referred to as the Ost Battalions. Uh, you see them a lot in Normandy and France, uh, but they were deployed in a number of German units as well. Uh, further, since uh, since the uh, Luftwaffe no longer has control of these units, they don't want to lose control of everything. So the Luftwaffe retains control of all of their flak units. So every single Luftwaffe field division lost their anti-aircraft battalion. 
and not just lost and not just it didn't not you know they weren't staying together they physically were removing the battalion from the unit so it stayed under low level command uh it further uh somewhere between 500 and 2000 soldiers were pulled out of every single one of these units uh to be retained under Luftwaffe c- command for various reasons uh some of them were being retrained to fill the paratrooper gap some of what uh some of them were being sent back to their old units for what uh, whatever reason the number of army reinforcements coming into the units was usually overtaken by the number of Luftwaffe troops being pulled back out <laughs> So for most of these units, at best, there is little change in quality. Uh, many many of the divisions actually went down in quality because they were weakened physically by the lift off of yanking stuff out. Uh, in regards to the uh, morale situation that you can obviously uh, imagine coming into this, you know, you're in some of the most stigmatized units in the German army right now. Uh, there is very little way in the, uh, of unit cohesion. Uh, at this point in the Luftwaffe field division. So many have been cut to pieces. So many others have yet to see action, but already have their bad reputation. Uh, then their current ex- uh, their current officers and commanders that they've known for months and or years at this point are yanked away and replaced by army guys who have the negative, repu- uh, the negative opinion of you. Uh, while these officers are going to hopefully train these guys better, their morale is not going to go up. Uh, that stigma of the first year, the the, the bad reputation of the divisions, that's never going to go away from this, uh, this point forward. Uh, there will be some Luftwaffe units that actually beat the odds and actually are at least adequate, if not actually good, but it's few and far between. Most of the units we haven't seen yet are going to be cut to pieces in their first battle, just like the last wave was. It's just going to take longer because they didn't see action until now. So... Uh, with that in mind, let's uh, cut the rest of pieces. Uh, we'll start. We'll start in the west because we kind of have to cover the whole ETO here. So I'll do this very briefly, slide by slide. Uh, three divisions in the west, uh, 16, 17, 18. Uh, all of these units fought uh, predominantly in France, although they served sometimes in Holland as well uh, before D-Day happened. Uh, these divisions were formed in late 42, uh, going into mid- early 43, but they didn't see action until after D-Day. Uh, and matter of fact, you're looking at the unit patch of the 17th Field Division there. Uh, they spent so much time building Atlantic Wall obstacles that they actually chose their patch to be an invasion obstacle over a divisional shield. You know, they felt themselves more as construction workers than military personnel. Uh, where it says absurd front lines to cover, uh, the 18th field division by itself was covering an 85 mile stretch of front line. Uh, and that was high for France and, and to say, and that's saying a lot for the German forces in France, because most of them were already covering 50, 60 mile, uh, mile ranges on average to cover 85 is even worse. Uh, when Normandy happened, all the divisions were in the South of France. And so they spent several weeks going from point A to point, uh, Normandy. And, dodging allied air attacks the whole way a lot of them were damaged on the way up and they fell apart very quickly once they got here uh this is actually where i think we can call on your expertise paul well uh, just because the 16th you know, I, I was i was doing some stuff with ben main and lawrence well that we were looking at operation charmwood and that that that, that was you know early july 44 and the 16th have some decent positions they 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 they, they, they are they appear to have the good ground they 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 hold things off for a while but the thing is, it's probably the influence of the 21st Panzer that's actually because they're they're effectively sharing the line with them. So there are some historians have said that actually the 16th performed quite well, but and and they kind of do, but it's not they're not doing their own thing there so much. It's just because they happen to be in with someone. The 21st Panzer have been engaged since the very last you know, the afternoon of June the 6th. So they've been in the field for a month. They kind of know the terrain, they know the enemy now. So but the initial the initial positions they hold in hold in Charmwood they are overrun pretty quickly. I mean, it, it, there's an initial kind of, oh dear, the British have some moving out problems, the South Staffs particularly um, approaching Corha, but but it, it, it doesn't hold, they don't hold for a long time. So it's a, it's a false, it's a false um, uh, illustration of what they can achieve, I think, really. They, they, they appear better than they are because they're with people who are better. Yes, exactly. Uh, you'll see that again in, as we go to Italy as well. Uh, one of the one of the divisions that actually has the reputation of being adequate also had five different SS neighbors on all sides helping them out, and they were in Italy, which also helps. 
Uh, but in the case of the 16th, you're right. They did. They held up fairly well at Charnwood. The problem is uh, Goodwood came after that, and the initial uh, air bombardment completely wiped the 16th from existence. There was almost nothing left. Uh, it's one of the divisions that actually was destroyed by that opening bombardment. Yeah, no, and, and when you say division, it was not a. It was a, already a smaller unit. Well, so it was. Yeah, it, it's and it's interesting that it does. You know, when when you're explaining things in Normandy, you know, and James Holland is here explaining you know, the, the the German units facing some of the British advice. It is a hodgepodge. Yeah, there's Fauschenberger, there's Luftwaffe field divisions, there's here, there's Waffen SS, there's SS, there's the static elements of the static divisions that then there's the hospitals as well troops as well i mean it is it's a it's a it's a nightmare it's a, you know no wonder there were confusions when the allies were capturing prisoners of he's wearing a different colored smock to that guy he's wearing a different one to that one who are you with i mean it was a it was a minefield to understand in some cases who they were fighting which is why we're still stuck when you read accounts of british officers fighting in this area they didn't even know quite who they were fighting because they, they were meeting people of such different units so that so regimental histories are still being printed where they're saying they are facing the SS and they weren't they were facing you know Luftwaffe ground divisions or, or 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 something else because they just were so confused about exactly who it was they were in, they were they were facing each day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and after Charnwood as well, you mentioned they weren't really at full strength at that point. Uh, after Charnwood, the 16th had already taken suffered a 75 percent casualty rate, and so what was left was destroyed by Goodwood. Uh, the 17th and 18th weren't destroyed as dramatically, but it uh, they didn't fault they didn't fare very well once they reached combat. Mm. Uh, I actually I see a question I wanted to answer also was a lot of 35 plus soldiers. Actually, the average age of these units was about 30 because we still are talking in core group of Luftwaffe troops here. Uh, so troop quality is still at least in terms of raw recruits, uh, the troop quality is still there. So these are younger units than you'd expect in the West. Uh, but because of their history and how they weren't really supported, uh, they're faring just as badly. Right. Okay. Um, I guess we're moving to Italy now. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, two other units that are haven't seen action yet, and they're not going to last much longer. Uh, the 19th and 20th didn't even reach the front line until Rome had fallen. Uh, they were assigned to 14th Army, the 14th Panzer Corps, under General Friedelin von Zenger and Ederlein and his memoirs. He does address them both, and they are not battle-worthy in his own views. Uh, my favorite uh, little notation about what the reforms did, the Army did to them when they reformed them, is they redesignated those units as, uh, make sure I got this right, uh, Storm Divisions, uh, Storm Divisions, Storm Division on it. Uh, which sounds elite and assault and all that jazz, but to make the 20th Luftwaffe a storm division, all they did was make sure that every man in every battalion had a bicycle. So it was, in theory, more mobile than the average Luftwaffe field division. Uh, you know, there's no mechanization, no heavy weapons. There's almost nothing really that's going to uh, uh, improve the real com uh, combat effectiveness of these units. Moreover, both the 19th and the 20th were four battalion divisions. That means combined, they didn't even equal a, a regular German army unit at this point. Right. Uh, the one thing that helped them uh, was the Italian terrain. Uh, Italy is pretty infamous in World War II for having very good defensive terrain. Uh, the 19th Luftwaffe was destroyed in six weeks. You know, that's actually a fairly good record compared to the ones we've already seen. Uh, and while the 20th lasted about six months, all the way to December, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, they had several high-class neighbors uh, that were helping them out on just about every single operation. They had at least uh, two Panzer divisions and several SS units alongside them as well. Uh, and uh, so they're definitely going to be uh, you know, lasting longer than they should probably, but it's not because of themselves. Uh, it's because they have help. All right. That's really all I have to say on the Italian division. So basically, we're going to be going from theater to theater here, just jumping. Bit, looking, looking at the underperformance, basically. Yeah, so Balkans now. Yeah. Uh, 11th actually might have the most interesting history of all these units because they're the ones that don't see real army to army fighting until they're already retreating out of the Balkans in late 44. Uh, most of their history was an anti partisan role in Greece. Uh, they're pretty widely uh, around in both Greece and Yugoslavia. Uh, a unit of the 11th captured the island of Leros after the Italians left the war uh, in late 43. Uh, there's uh, actually some pretty rich records available on the 11th because they were in an occupation role. You can see uh, there's a bunch of old uh, uh, Greco-German propaganda. I'm not sure that's a word, but it is now. 
uh, but you know, Nazi pro Nazi pro, uh, propaganda in uh, uh, in Greece, trying to you know coax loyalty towards the ruling regime. Uh, the eleventh has a minor role uh, in a, the start of the Greek civil war that's going to follow World War II, because when they left Greece, they had to go th- quite literally through the Greek partisan groups to do it. And they did that by uh, getting a deal, basically. The Greeks offered them safe passage in exchange for most of their heavy weapons. Uh, So the the Greeks got some uh, Nazi-era artillery and such to uh, bolster their partisan ranks as the 11th left Greece. Uh, Speaking of which, September 44, uh, the Germans in general will pull out of the Balkans because the Red Army is coming. Uh, The 11th is going to be chased by the Red Army and also the Bulgarians uh, for pretty much the rest of the war. They'll survive the war, but barely. They're basically on the run for nine months and then finally find the British in Austria uh, in May of 1945. All right. And then back back to the Eastern Front? Yes, uh, multiple divisions to cover in the East. Uh, no more in the South. Those units are dead. But uh, we have the center and the North to deal with. And the North, until this point, has been a pretty quiet front. It's been the Siege of Leningrad since '41, and now we're about to end that siege. That's what this uh, offensive actually is. Uh, what's called the Leningrad Novgorod Offensive, uh, started on 14 January 44. It's kind of hard to parcel out what what's happening on this map because I couldn't get it to fit all uh, what I wanted to on this thing. But uh, basically, I marked out sort of where the divisions are. Uh, you can see Leningrad right at the top center of the map. Uh, to the left of that, you can see the little pink pocket. That is the Oranienbaum pocket, uh, which is currently held by the Soviet Second Shock Army. Uh, and on the eastern edge of that pocket, uh, basically the way to Leningrad from the pocket is uh, two Luftwaffe field divisions, uh, the 9th and 10th are defending that front. The Germans are worried enough about that, about having two divisions right next to each other on a pocket as important as that. They actually slipped an SS engineer battalion right between them to try to bolster the line. Didn't matter much, but it was there. Uh, the 12th and 13th field divisions were on the north uh, eastern edge near Lake uh, Lagoda and also the Volkov River. Uh, scroll down the Volkov a little bit on the east, you'll find the city of Novgorod. Uh, the first division is above Novgorod, the 21st is south of it. Uh, so we have a little starting markers for this offensive. Uh, when the offensive begins, the 9th and the 10th are going to be hit by 100,000 artillery rounds in one hour. Uh, those, the second shock army is just going to blast the two divisions and blast right through them. Uh, those two divisions are gone within a week. Uh, the 12th and 13th managed to avoid the major Soviet thrust, so they survive for a time and back up, uh, but they end up getting caught. You can see over all those red arrows are starting to converge towards the south of the map. The 13th and 12th are f- basically falling back along those lines. Uh, they'll eventually run into the 21st, uh, retreating from Novgorod. Uh, sorry, I got a little discombobulated with my description there. Sorry about that. Uh, the 1st Division, however, north of Novgorod, that one also takes a full brunt Soviet push. They're gone within four days. Uh, just completely overran by a Soviet front. Uh, whatever was left was mopped up rather quickly. Uh, so we already have half of these six units gone uh, as of this point. And by the time we get to the end of the offensive, the 13th has dissolved as well. So we're down to two, the 12th and the 21st. We're not done with these units yet because both the 12th and the 21st are going first are actually going to survive the war. Uh, so we uh, will come back to these units a little bit to just know that they are still alive, but the Russians have succeeded in the offensive and four more of these units are gone. Uh, our next slide is even more succinct, quite frankly. Uh, this is not only the, the anniversary of Barbarossa, it's also the anniversary of Bagration. Uh, and the the map that you're looking at is the city of Vitebsk uh, along the northern edge of the Army Group Center front. Uh, it's defended by 3rd Panzer Army, which includes the 4th and the 6th uh, field divisions. Uh, at this point, these two units are barely around to begin with. Combined, they only muster five battalions. Uh, and the 6th, Luf- to give you an idea on how badly that logistics chain failed, uh, the 6th Luftwaffe, uh, as of... Uh, May of 1944, so just right before this started, is down to less than 500 combatants before the operation even began. It's still on the on the map as a division, but there's only about a battalion's worth of guys in the unit right now. Uh, the Germans have these units stationed right on the front of on Vitebsk. The Soviets will capture the city rather quickly, and the two divisions are destroyed with it. 
Uh, you actually can sort of see there's the big pocket at Vitebsk, but right to the left of it, you can see a, a very tiny little pocket that actually is labeled for uh, the fourth Luftwaffe field division. You can see where that one was actually surrounded and destroyed. Uh, so these two units were off the map in three days. Uh, that we've uh, so here we are uh, several slides later, and we're down to almost nothing still around for these units. Uh, despite the army reforms, almost no change in most of these uh, units' effectiveness. Um, I think we have one slide left here. Yeah, yes. survivors. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so at this point, uh, let's just fast forward to the end here. The 12th and the 21st will survive the war, uh, even though they were uh, chased out of, away from Leningrad. Uh, they, they and Army Group North were chased into what became known as the Kurland Pocket by the end of the war, and that survived actually past what past Hitler, honestly. Uh, the Kurland Pocket eventually surrendered at the very, very end of the war. These two divisions were part of that pocket. Uh, the 11th barely survived as well, chased out of the Balkans, but they made it. Uh, we haven't even talked about the 14th yet because the 14th had the cushiest job of all these units. They got, they were stationed in Norway. They saw absolutely no action, uh, and they were there from be, from their deployment to the end of the war, and that was it. If you had to get stuck with one of these units, that was the one to get stuck with. Mm. Uh, now, when it says good units, there actually are some to point out. 21 of these units deployed to combat. Uh, two of them were actually recognized as being truly effective, both the 12th and the 21st. And we've seen the 21st before. That was Division Meidel. There's reason There's reason to understand that. Well, the better ones, yeah. Exactly, yes. The one that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, however, is the 12th. They have the exact same history as every other unit that we've talked about, and they performed possibly better than every other unit we've talked about, including Division Meidel. Uh, there is... Uh, I, it's actually the most frustrating thing about my, about my dissertation. I have no way to explain why the 12th did as well as they did. They are the only unit that beat the odds and became good. Uh, the only thing I can think of is there was a year between their deployment and their first real battle. Maybe they got some extra training time to, uh, in, but their uh, records don't show it. Right. Okay. Just or just just yeah, one of those anomalies that 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 frustrate historians, but but make for interesting. Um, research, I guess. Yeah. Uh, in terms of unit strength, they they were one of the stronger manpower units. They had about 12,000 men as opposed to t the usual 10. Uh, they also had about 50 artillery pieces compared to the usual 20, but that was really about it. I mean, there's not much more to say on those two, on, on that unit. Uh, it survived and it, you know, it was barely a, a unit at that point. It certainly can't be called a division by the end of the Curlin pocket, but the unit was still there. Uh, you also see commendations made uh, towards the 5th, the 11th, and the 20th field divisions over the course of the war. Uh, at best, they're adequate. Uh, all that can be explained away, the 20th by its neighbors. Uh, we didn't talk about the 5th in this presentation, but they did pretty well during the early days of the Russian front. Uh, uh, ultimately did better than, any, than the 7th and the 8th, which were their peers down there. Uh, the 11th was mostly fighting partisans, which explains their long uh, work history. Eventually, when they found an army, they got they had to retreat as well. Uh, but here we are, five out of 21 actually deemed at least adequate units. Uh, well, that's, not, that's not great, considering Goering's kind of promise at the beginning. that This would be something that would be... It, it, it wasn't presented, if we go back to the beginning of this presentation, as kind of a stopgap. This was something that he was... He was behind. It was. It was. This, this was something that would be the honor of the Luftwaffe. He wasn't. He. 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 He believed in this idea. So it. It clearly didn't come anywhere near to uh, matching up with his projections. And we had the question um, from uh, Rolf there. Was anyone uh, to receive a Knight's Cross or anything uh, equivalent within the field division? Uh, I don't have any specific names in my notes, but I want to say yes. They just might not have gotten them with those units. Uh, because a lot of these guys ended up serving with two or three other di other divisions. Like, for instance, uh, General Hans Hecker, who commanded the 17th Luftwaffe, ended up being the uh, commander of the 167th Folks uh, Grenadier Unit. Uh, Eugen Meindl uh, served with the Fallschirmjäger uh, Division. I think, actually, I think it was a corps after he was done with these units. Uh, yeah, Parish Corps, wasn't it? Yeah, Second Parish, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, I really should know this guy's name. Uh, but there is one Luftwaffe officer from the Eastern Front who ends up being one of the highest ranked officers left at the end of the Battle of Britain. Uh, so right. that's something there as well. Uh, I want to I say his name is Pistorius, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> 
Yeah. And, you know, and we're getting a question there. If Leslie's asking, you know, were, were there any heads to roll because of these failures? And I mean, I think I think this is where we, we're going to we sum up this conversation is that it seems to me this whole this whole story has fallen through the cracks. Goering, Goering of course, doesn't you know, is de dead anyway at the end of the war. But and, and if there's lots of things to beat Goering over this over the head with, there's lots of stuff, Spitfires and Hurricanes and Battle of Britain and Operation Sea Lion. This this in the grand in the in the things of uh, things that Goring fucked up at this is on a big list of things so i suppose it's several down the rung mindel who died in i think in 1951 probably didn't you know didn't survive into the era of doing his own memoirs and if he had done his own memoirs he'd have concentrated on the on the on the stuff with the falschermaker where he did very well and would have just kind of i assume ignored this part of his although as you said his unit was one of the better ones but he would have not been drawing attention to the field divisions because it wasn't something to be proud of. But beyond yeah. that, you know, at the end of the war, I mean, I got it. The, if this had been a US or British thing, there would have been investigation into why it had done so bad because the German army ceases to exist. I guess there was no, there was no um, um, aftermath. Not really, no. I mean, the, the one thing we can say about Goering's relationship with Hitler is that it was already going downhill by the end of 1942 when he proposed these mm -hmm. units. Uh, once these units failed, this is one of the, the last points where Hitler really trusted Goering. Yeah. Uh, because anyone who knows uh, Goering's history knows that while he started as the number two Nazi, uh, he did not retain that through the entire war. He kept disappointing Hitler time and time again. This is one of the last times he did that. Uh, yeah. And while his head was the thing he kept was the loyalty, wasn't it? I mean, he, he was underperforming in every area. But I suppose from Hitler's point of view, when other people are literally trying to, to bump him off by a certain part of the war, during yeah. it was nothing else but a loyal puppy uh, right till the bitter end. So I suppose that was the only thing Hitler had in his favor by then. But yeah, clearly had underperformed. And I mean, you, you look at the look at the performance. One of the things didn't come up is the Luftwaffe looking after the... Uh, the prisoner war camps and the fact that you know the great escape from Stagler three that was ultimately Goring's responsibility that that happened in a so there's lots of the reasons for Hitler to, to to be disappointed with Goring's performance and they just get worse and worse but he's always there he's he's the he's the loyal lapdog right till the bitter end yeah for well, beyond the bitter end isn't he really I mean he's still loyal after yeah. after he was dead so yeah, yeah I mean the the next thing is going to sum things up. Really, is is it seems to me this your your work for your for your PhD. There's there's two in, areas of interest in this. One, there's this actual study of what these field divisions did and how they were set up and how they were trained and how they were deployed with very various, various levels of of, of success. Mm -hmm. But the other one, I think, is this is that why they haven't been picked up as kind of an example of just the inefficiency of the Third Reich because. You know, we talk, you know, James Holland talks about the, the gas mask canister as being an example of an overly produced, uh, overly engineered thing they're still making in 1945. To me, this whole concept is something that could be used as an illustration of, we said this right at the beginning of the show, of, of how not to not to maximize your forces when things are going against you. Everything they did was against um, streamlining logic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's actually the biggest single thing you can find in the existing scholarship on the Luftwaffe field divisions. My dissertation is I'm being looked at by publishers. I don't want to name names to you know scare anybody right. away, but uh, there are a few existing books if you're interested. They aren't fantastic, but they exist. Uh, if you want the best book, you need to be able to read German. But uh, camera, there we go. Yeah. Uh, the it's just simply called the German Luftwaffe field divisions, 41 to 45. The author is Werner Haupt. Uh, the publisher is right here. It's in German. Got to read that. But uh, if you don't, if you don't read German, there are English sources available. Uh, it's going to look interesting, but here it is: Arms and Armor Press uh, by Carlos Spray. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, the uh, Luftwaffe Field Division is forty-one forty-five. Uh, it is a rather quick read, as you can see, but the basic information is there. Uh, if you're into a more sizable book, we have one other option too. Uh, called Gehring's Grenadiers. The author is Antonio Munoz. This is uh, publisher Axis Europa Books. Right. Uh, I have to say, being someone who's read all these way too many times to count, they're all the same book. Uh, if, if They have a very brief intro. This is where they came from. Gehring and Hitler made a mistake. And then every single one of them goes basically unit by unit in as succinct a history as you can possibly get. They're not so much books as they are encyclopedias of these units. 
so if you're interested, they do these books do exist. Uh, I highly recommend the Haupt if you can get it. Uh, my book will be the first uh, once it's once it's published, whenever that may be. Uh, will be the first work in English that's actually an academic work on the subject. Right. Well, uh, we look forward to that. And F Philip Phil Blood is saying the system did fit with German military logic, and I think he wishes he'd put speech marks around logic there. But that you know that is how that is how the German military worked. Then it, it, we we can we can. We can look at it now and see how badly organized it was, especially because we can compare it to the Allied structure. And that's one of the things when I'm talking about not overlord is that within the Allied plan, everyone knows where their responsibility begins and ends. They know that they know who's in charge of what. There's there's a clear hierarchy in everything about the Germans, pretty much from from the middle of the war onwards. There's always this. So he's in charge of this on a Tuesday, but on Wednesday it becomes charge of his. And then it changes again because there's another meeting. With, and, you know, and I'm, we're not. We're not exaggerating. That is kind of how the, the, the Germans function. I'm not saying that there aren't individual combat units that are very, very efficient at a lower level, but the, the organizational aspect is just really, really muddy. And that's a polite way of describing it, I think. Uh, once I get done with the, I mean, the dissertation is the first book, but I, my next research subject is actually going into the the existing uh, Luftwaffe ground divisions and also fitting them more into that overall den of chaos mm -hmm. that is the German high command. Uh, if you're looking for books on the German High Command as as currently uh, as currently exists, I uh, can't not recommend uh, Jeff McGargy's book Inside Hitler's High Command. That is the bedrock for understanding how that inst institution worked or didn't uh, as the war went on. Good idea. And and someone just mentioned, which didn't come up, the um the air landing division was another another concept, an another branch on the tree of organizations that is another an, uh, yeah, another subject for another day uh niels who's watching i could could talk about them in normal than the 91st particularly but yeah I, I know i know the british and americans have lots of complicated uniforms at that kind of special forces level when we kind of kind of private you know popsky's armies and lrdg and sas and sbs all that kind of stuff but at the at the top level when you get the corps and armies our system yeah the ref and the british army they know exactly what each other are doing pretty much. And, and of course, in the Americans, the, the Army Air Corps is part of the army anyway. So, so, but the Germans, it is, it is still ridiculously complicated. We could keep repeating it, but, you know, and if folks who are watching it, you know, getting up, if you're starting the subject and you're trying to understand Waffen SS and SS, and then, and people have been talking about the Hermann Goering division, which you mentioned, which is another anomaly that doesn't quite fit in any of the categories. It's kind mm -hmm. of, a separate one in its own right you know that it's it's it is just complicated and understanding the german side of things is always more complicated than it is the allied side um well it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you i'm going to just take you off screen for a second while i remind people what's coming up and i'll come bring you back on in a minute so tomorrow folks another fascinating subject um uh, pete blanchard is coming on again he did a show about the armor in the spanish civil war he's talking about the recycling of the early model German Panzers into other types of vehicles later on. So that continues the theme. Then Friday, I'm really looking forward to that show. Lisa Marie Freitag is coming on to talk about how the Germans have commemorated their war dead. Everyone watching this, I'm sure, has been to a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery or one of the ABMC cemeteries. We understand how our Western uh, victorious nations have honored our war dead and the British Legion and poppies and, and yeah, Veterans Day, all that kind of thing. But we're going to hear about how the Germans have done it. And that'll be a really interesting subject because I know basically nothing about it. So I'm going to bring Michael back on essentially to say goodbye. So, um, Michael, I mean, absolutely fantastic. A fantastic tour de force um, uh, early performance on World War II TV. I, I'm, I'm going to extend an invitation to come back and do something else when, when you carry on with your research because you managed to take a complicated subject and make it understandable, even though obviously... We were we were over we, we could have gone down numerous rabbit holes and entered some of those battles and campaigns at much greater level detail. But you know, you've taken us through this minefield in a fantastic way. So we can we can thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, there we are then. So this is Paul Woodadge and Michael Stout from World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Thank you everybody for watching today and thank you very much for your support generally. So cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>